welcome back. Thanks for joining me again. And as we rejoin the Abbott and Costello filmography, we come to a fairly interesting point in their careers. So by this point, Abbott and Costello have been making movies for close to a decade. They are established names in Hollywood, reliable box office, either box office superstars or at the very least box office successes. Um, and as we've discussed in previous entries, their clout at the studio had kind of grown. They fought with the studio numerous times over pay, over control, and what eventually happened uh, during their last renegotiation with Universal is they had reached a deal similar to the one they had made when they were allowed to go to MGM once or twice a year to do a, a picture outside of Universal, they made a similar deal wherein once a year they could go outside the studio and produce a film themselves. They had that much clout now that they could put their own money into the picture, make the big creative decisions, and reap the financial benefits. So that is where this film comes in and it also kind of contributes to the unique selling history of this movie so a lot of you kids out there watching this won't know this experience and I feel sorry for you because of that because you're missing out on something wonderful um, the, the glory of a DVD store or a video store or a CD store that would sell DVDs you know you don't you don't know that and I'm sorry for you I really am um, but you'd go in and there would always be this rack of discount movies. You know, things for like three bucks or five bucks or something. Like that. And they'd be these titles that you'd never heard of. You don't see them a lot on Turner Classic Movies. Uh, back in the day when you had kind of independent TV stations, these would be the movies that would run on those stations a lot. Um, you can still find them. Uh, there's a... There's a website, I think, ClassicDVDs.com, I think is what it is. And you can still find a lot of these films. And what these are, are these are films that were made for these independent studios outside of the major ones that nobody really owns the, the rights to anymore. And so, therefore, I could buy these movies and put them out online and, you know, basically get in no trouble for it. And in fact, people do. You can find a lot of these movies on YouTube if you really search for them uh, because nobody owns those film rights any longer. So that was kind of the downside. And of course, there's no way they could have predicted that back in the day when they uh, went to Nasor Studios and produced this film, Africa Screams. <laughs> um, so there's some things to unpack about this movie. Um, so, uh, before we get into the, the nuts and bolts, let's talk about the story. So, what is the plot this time? So, in this film, Bud and Lou play two booksellers who, um, by sheer chance, Lou's character, Stanley Livings Livington, uh, is a fan of wildlife adventure books written by big name, uh, explorers of the day like Clyde Bentley and Frank Buck, both of whom have cameos in this movie. And he reads all of these, you know, explorer, adventurer, I went hiking, I went hunting, I did this books, and memorizes them. And into the store comes uh, a young woman played by an actor named Hilary Brooke, who we'll talk about in a second. And she wants a book that's out of print. Lou has read it. And he's memorized, supposedly, the map that was inside it, a map that leads to uh, what will turn out to be a diamond mine in Africa. So since she can't get the book through circumstances, she hires Bud and Lou on to come with her on the expedition to Africa. And, you know, basically they get into a lot of corny situations in Africa. So that's the, that's the basic premise of this one. Uh, from According to legend... The genesis of this film came actually during their filming of The Noose Hangs High when Lou was being driven home. Um, and I can't remember exactly, but I think he saw like a big cat being scared <coughs> by a smaller cat on the side of the road. And he said to his driver, he said, 
Uh, that's a great idea. Do we have any animal jokes? And that kind of became the, the genesis for this, uh, for this film. But you also have to understand about this film is that at the time, Film strips, short subjects, entire movies about the jungle, about Africa, were very much in demand. You know, of course, you can look at the success of the Tarzan franchise as uh, contributing to that. But again, Explorers, Clyde Bentley, Frank Buck, they would do entire movies about them going into the jungle and, you know, taming the jungle problematic. We're going to talk about the problematic elements of this movie here in a minute, but so don't worry. Um, so this was not kind of as out there as an idea as it sounded. The, you know, the, the, the title of this film, Africa Screams, is actually a parody of a Clyde Bentley film. So I think it's like Africa Calls was the name of it or something to that effect. Uh, they had originally wanted to uh, name the, the, the movie Bring Them Back Dead. Uh, which was another parody of a, one of his films called Bring Him Back Alive, because he would go into the jungle and capture wild animals. Again, problematic, which we'll talk about. Hold on. <laughs> um, so that's kind of where the genesis of this film came from. Now, here's the interesting thing about this movie. So, if you recall from our discussion on Mexican Hayride, one of lose demands when they were having their latest dispute with Universal was the fact that he felt their co-stars were not up to scratch. You know, he wanted beggar name co-stars. So with this, now with this picture, he and Bud had the, the clout and the power to basically get the cast they wanted. And while they didn't grab any huge names, they managed to populate this film with uh, Abbott and Costello collaborators and favorites who kind of make up a lot of their later work. Uh, if for nothing else, I love this movie because it's a time capsule of Abbott and Costello co-stars throughout the years. And kind of you can see who some of their favorites were and why, because the cast works really well together. So Hilary Brook, who plays our main uh, female lead as well as our main antagonist really um, was such a favorite of theirs that she would become the female lead for the Abbott and Costello show, their show which we'll talk about several videos down the line uh, she was basically the Elaine of that show, she kind of you know, she was lose love interest or she would fill in whatever job they needed to perpetuate whatever skit they needed to do you know, so she was a she was a favorite of theirs, and from what I understand, from what I've read, uh, she was very nervous about it. She'd never done comedy before, um, but she learned very quickly. I, I mean, you look at the pedigree of comic geniuses she had to kind of learn at the knee of in this film, and you can see why. I mean, Abbott and Costello definitely, but there are some others in here we'll talk about in a second. Uh, likewise, her two henchmen. Uh, played by brother team Max and Buddy Bear. And that's not a joke. That's their actual name. Uh, B-A-E-R. Bear. Two big, big dudes. Which is always funny when you have little Lou Costello with two really big pro wrestler looking guys. As a matter of fact, Buddy Bear, the younger of the two, the little brother, <laughs> was actually a, a, a championship boxer at one time. Um, he would actually make several appearances in future Abbott and Costello projects as well. Uh, rounding out the cast are two phenomenal comics. So we see the return of Shemp Howard, the, you know, the long, uh, long underrated fourth stooge, um, who uh, of course has appeared in several Abbott and Costello films in the Navy, Hold That Ghost, It Ain't Hey. Um, he had been around them for a while, and they really liked him, and he worked well with them, so he came onto this picture for a part. Uh, likewise, uh, Joe Besser, a comedian that uh, Lou had met years before, and they kind of look alike, and uh, Joe Besser's main thing was, I don't know quite how to describe his, his, his on-screen persona, but this very kind of, you know, surly, but 
always like a little kid on the verge of a temper tantrum. His big gig, his big, you know, thing was to like, you know, kind of, I'll harm you, you know, and just kind of bop you. Um, and Lou loved this guy. And with good reason. Joe was a very, very funny man. In fact, now here's a little, here's a fun piece of comedy history. So, as mentioned, Shemp Howard was the original third stooge, along with Larry and Mo. Um, and he left the group to kind of pursue a solo career. And that's when, of course, the very famous pairing of, or not really pairing, whatever you call it for three people, of Larry, Mo, and Curly. Curly Howard came into the act. When Curly passed away, Shemp came back and took over as the third stooge. He was the third stooge for quite a while. When he passed away, they brought in Joe Besser as the third stooge, and he was with them for about 16 shorts. I only can remember one of them, honestly, but I, apparently he was in like 16 of them. So, uh, so you have two members of the Three Stooges playing opposite Abbott and Costello in this movie. So, it's, uh, like I said, Hillary Brooke had a, a an amazing comic pedigree uh, backing her up in this movie, and she learned well. She learned how to be a good straight person and um, how to handle her own comic lines from working with these four geniuses. And uh, they are. Uh, the best parts of this movie are just anytime these four are on stage in any combination. The film itself, in terms of uh, how it holds up compared to other Abbott and Costello films, it's interesting because just like Mexican Hayride, it feels a lot more like one of their earlier pictures in that the plot is kind of secondary. We're just there to kind of get to one beat, one comic uh, exchange to the next. That's not a bad thing because, again, it just feels like whether they're coming off the high still of uh, meets Frankenstein or if because uh, they hired two of their radio show writers to do punch-ups on the script, Bud and Lou just seem a lot crisper than they have in past films, you know? I'm never going to say that they were phoning it in during this time, but I think in, pri in uh, prior to Meets Frankenstein, you can see in some of their films that they're a little tired, they're a little fatigued, the, 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 thing, the act isn't as crisp as it once was. But I think having the control of the picture, I think, again, coming off the big success still of Meets Frankenstein and having two writers who, who worked really well with them uh, coming up with the bits, I think it really helped, you know, rejuvenate the script. And I think the end product is they're coming at this with a lot more energy and a lot more fierceness than we've seen from them in a little while. Because, um, yeah, they just seem really on point. Interesting thing I noticed about this film is that I really feel like uh, Lou's characterization is slightly different here than it is in a lot of their movies. I mentioned this way, way back when we first started doing these, move, these uh, reviews, that there's a very slight variation in Lou Costello's character in the movies as opposed to his character on the radio show. On the radio show, his character is a little bit more brash and a little bit more of a jerk sometimes. You know, the movies always portrayed him as this uh, child in a man's body, this innocent who's always kind of being forced into situations that he's not ready for or prepared for or wants to be in either by Bud or by some other outside force, and he does the best he can to survive. Whereas the radio show, a lot of the trouble he gets into is of his own making, because he mouths off or something to that effect. It's a slight variation, but it is there. And I do feel like in this film, a lot of it is, the the forward motion of the film is driven by his more braggadocious character. That's not a word. That's not a word. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the more pompous uh, pompousness of his character. Let's try that one. Um, bragging that he's done all these things he's never done without any uh, coaxing from Bud. This is just him putting on airs. You know, one of the running jokes of this film is when he beats both Clyde Bentley and Frank Buck, uh, two actual explorers and animal trainers of the time, 
um, he doesn't recognize them, but he tells them these lies about, you know, when I, you know, I knew Clyde Bentley and I taught him everything he knows when he and I did this and he, you know, and the, the joke being, of course, that they, you know, they know who they are and they're just letting him run off at the mouth and this gets him into more and more trouble. So it's a slight variation on the character and I don't know if it works or not, but it definitely, again, there's an injection of something different and a new energy into it. And I think that's beneficial to them in the long run. Um, uh, so <laughs> let's talk briefly uh, about uh, now we got, we have to come to this because if you're talking about um, any film from the 1940s that takes place in Africa, uh, we must talk about the problematic elements of this film. And as I was getting ready to watch this film, uh, after quite a few years, it's been a while since I, I'd watched this one, uh, I was I was nervous about it because you know there's going to be problematic issues with it. I mean, let me give you an example. It took a long time for me to make the title card for this episode because the poster for this film, just about every poster... Uh, is very problematic. There are some not okay images on those posters. <laughs> and, uh, it took a while to find one that I was like, okay, and I really, had to, I really scanned it and really looked at it closely to go, okay, you know, okay, I don't see anything. I think we're good here. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, so how, so how problematic is this movie? Uh, well, on a scale of one to ten. One being the lowest, ten being the highest. Um, I think this one clocks in at about a five, to be honest. For a lot of the film, it's okay. The you know, there's not a lot of problems with the film for about I'd say eighty percent of its run. There, are, you know, you see a couple African American actors in the background, just as you know, you know, locals, not even natives, but locals, you know, just in jeans and shirts, and they're moving crates. You're like, okay. That kind of gives me an icky feeling, but it's nothing truly offensive. All right, so that's about 80% of the film. But then, towards the end of it, um, <laughs> they encounter a tribe of cannibals. And that's all I'm going to say. Um, uh, I'm going to say that I, I I tried, and there comes a point where it's like, I, I can't. I, you know, And it kind of, yeah... <laughs> It spurns the entire final chase scene, and you just go, oh, and there's a there's a moment in that final chase scene that's really just off the chart. And it's like, oh, oh, bad, bad, bad. The only reason I give this one a five, as opposed to making it go higher, is because, again, it's only in the last little bit of the movie. You could watch the rest of this movie up to that point and just zip through that last bit, or even to omit the last bit entirely, and you can still enjoy the parts of it that are there, you know? But, yeah, that last bit. And I don't think it's as bad as, say, Congo Maisie, which is really bad. Really bad. Which is, again, a shame, because that's that, the, the story of that movie is actually pretty good. But, boy, yeah, ouch. That, that, that movie just... So it's not in that ballpark. But... It's still pretty bad. Um, almost worse is the uh, um, the lion taming aspects of it. Again, uh, Clyde Bentley, who was a famous lion tamer and animal, uh, I don't know what you call him, animal trainer of the time, and he had a he had done a couple movies. Um, you know, this this is not this is not Steve Irwin. You know, this is not, ooh, these creatures are beautiful and wonderful and, you know, we should respect them. This is, oh, an animal, let me snap a whip at it. And they have an extended lion taming scene in here, which is equally difficult to watch. And it's just like, I, I, I'm going to hit the fast forward on that. So it's weird that the, the animal training is, I, I think, kind of on par with the, the, the blatant racism of, the, of this movie. Um... And you don't know what to say about it. There's nothing you can say about it. There's no excuse for it. You know, it was the the level of sensitivity common at the time. And, you know, um, that's not an excuse. It's just a statement of fact. And, yeah, it's... it's uh, 
But if you take that part out, and you can, you can very easily omit that part. The film, up till then, is still really fun, and uh, a neat, like I say, a neat time capsule of Bud and Lou's career at that time, and of comedy at that time. So many comic legends in this movie. Um, to close out, one quick other story. So this is a funny, uh, speaking in terms of problematic issues, I think this film, of all their movies, this one and Ride'em Cowboy have definitely aged the worst. Um, I, it's a debate over which one of them have aged worse, but they are definitely on par with one another in terms of, you know, aging. Uh, but here's a, one last little fun story. So one of the running jokes in this film is that during one of their many chase scenes, uh, Lou accidentally frees a gorilla from a trap that's been set for it that Frank Buck, the famous... Uh, game hunter had laid so he rescues this gorilla accidentally and the gorilla falls in love with him and begins to like follow him around and help him out and you know do all these little things uh, to kind of help him out of scrapes during the movie well when the censors got a hold of that uh, afraid of the bestiality uh, undertones or subtext they they vehemently said we cannot have a female gorilla falling in love with a human man. We can't have it. You have to change it. Have to change it. So they changed it to a male. They changed the gorilla to a male, and the censors were okay with that and let it through. So it became a joke around Hollywood because of this movie that that year gay gorillas were in. And they, uh, one writer would tell the other, hey, you can put a gay gorilla in there. It's fine. The censors don't care about that. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how appropriate that story is these days, but I, I just thought it was funny. Uh, it reminds me very much of stories from uh, the making of the South Park movie years ago. Uh, but anyway, uh, not not one of their best pictures, uh, but definitely a fun, energetic romp up until a certain point. And I think it's worth a look here and there. I, I, I think there are better films to go through before you get to this one. But... It's uh, it's not without its charms. So, there you have it. That's my take on Africa Screams. Now, when we come back, we finally start to see the influence of Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. As mentioned in that review, the, the supporting cast there was made up of a who's who of horror icons. One, the only one missing was the original Frankenstein's monster, but this time we are going to rectify that particular problem because when next we meet at a spooky hotel in the middle of nowhere, Abbott and Costello will meet the killer, Boris Karloff. So, I look very much forward to uh, sharing that film with so thank you for joining me. Thanks for coming along for the ride. Uh, and as always, drive safe, and I will see you at the movies.